Welcome to Action Taken, the podcast about relevant topics for both Black and Christian communities. This is a podcast for seasoned believers, those who have hidden the Word of God in their hearts, as David spoke in Psalm 119 and 11. And I am your host, Coach Laverne. That's Laverne without the E on the end. This is Lesson 28, with this episode entitled, The Protocols for Miracles, Guiding the Hearts of Men. As always, the vision within must be allowed to penetrate without. The ultimate vision, the ultimate agenda for the church is to get the bride of Christ ready for her bridegroom, Jesus. There may be other faith projects we will have to invest time in and in our generations, but until you see the heavens crack open and the trumpet sounds, the vision for the body of Christ will always be to have his bride ready for wedding and on time. I hear constantly people saying Jesus is returning, Jesus is coming, and it's true, Jesus is returning, but nothing will happen until his bride without spot or wrinkle is ready to meet him at the altar. A bridegroom will wait all day if he knows his bride is ultimately coming down the aisle. So if Jesus appears to be delayed, it is because we are expecting the bride to get ready all on, all on her own. Having said all that, this is season two, April 24th, Fourth to June 26, it is a season of the narrow way, the narrow path, the season meant to eliminate a lot of participants. In other words, cut out the fat, and in some cases, literally, if you are carrying more weight than you should, get your weight down, your blood pressure down, your blood sugar down, and your cholesterol down. Be a person given to fasting and prayer. Don't take it for granted that you will succeed in the season simply because you love the Lord and adore Him. This season is for the fit among us in spirit, soul, and body. Get the sin out of your life. That's if no one hasn't already told you. All right. Um, I don't know how, how I'm getting this, but I I've, I sense that I'm going to have to start doing two of these a day. And, and if you know anything about putting content together, content, it takes a long time to do this. I don't do a whole lot of editing. Like a lot of a lot of uh, YouTubers do, but um, it takes some time to render these and get them ready for just uh, dis distribution, putting them on different platforms, etc. And but I I feel really strongly led of the Lord to um, start doing two of these until I'm directed otherwise. Because the content, there's so much going on politically, and I'm not necessarily talking about Donald Trump, but uh, it, it just seems like this, it's a very crucial time politically in the spirit, and or in the spirit politically, <laughs> um, that uh, I'm being led to do this twice a day don't necessarily want to do it but I feel compelled to so this one is about um, what's going on in the United States politics with a, a number of different propositions going on in um, the Senate which is part of the US governmental system um, and this is specifically about West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin. Um, and on the one hand, I'm, I'm trying to come down. I'm trying to come down as equ equally balanced, neither for nor against, but just coming down on the side of the kingdom and what's best for kingdom dwellers and people who are not believers. You know. You don't necessarily have to be a believer to listen to this particular podcast, but you do have to understand what's going on. Um, and I watched something on a political show. And I'm, as you know, I went to um, an Ivy League school here in New York. And one of the things, one of the classes I took was how to do statistical summaries. It was a statistical reasoning type of um, course. And I'm of the impression that you can make statistics do anything. You can make them sound and say anything. But, and these particular numbers that I was seeing on this particular show about um, the position of Mr. Manchin's 
um, constituents about particular topics related to some of the more important bills going across um, going through the Senate were very interesting and I wanted to look at it closer because I was thinking well if that's interesting I would like to know what is the opinion of what's going on in Arizona because I know Arizona is a very conservative state and so is West Virginia but they have Democratic senators. They have one Republican. Well, for West Virginia, they have one Republican and one Democrat, and um, Democrat being Mr. Mr. Manchin. And so I'm looking at these numbers, and I was like, wow, that's really interesting. I would love to see the raw data. And typically, when you get, uh, you know, people talk, talking about polling data and stuff like that, they actually provide the raw data, but they also provide a summary of the findings of the person who did the survey. So I was looking for the raw data and um, what I found only was the summary findings. Now, summary findings don't really tell me anything personally because it, it basically just is like a memo stating um, 73% felt this way, 68% felt this way, da, da 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 but they really didn't um, bring it home for me in terms of what West Virginians felt about this. So that, you know, Mr. Manchin, regardless of his political views and how he governs his um, voting practice, because everybody in the Senate and in the House of Representatives has a voting practice, meaning that there is something that guides their heart to vote a certain way. Um, sometimes they look to um, something within themselves, their own personal values. Um, sometimes it's the people who fund their campaign. Sometimes it's um, others within the Senate that if this person votes that way, then I will vote that way as well. Um, so it's something that guides them. It's like their own internal compass. And that internal compass is linked to a philosophy. If this person goes that way, then I'll go that way. If this particular organization who has funded my campaign says I should vote this way, then I'll vote that way, etc. cetera. All right. Um, that being the case, when they were showing these findings about, well, this is what West Virginians um, feel about these particular topics, I was like, oh, that's very interesting. So, but when I look at the findings, it doesn't say specifically West Virginia. It says that they polled Arkansas, Arizona, Georgia, Iowa, I think that's Maine, Nevada, New Hampshire, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia, <coughs> and why, um, Wisconsin, and Wisconsin. Um, from February 9th to February 15th of 2021, with a margin of error, um, uh, conf uh, with confidence level of 95%, with a plus or minus of 2.7, the margin of error on subsam subsamples is greater. This is what they said about the poll. This is in their own footnotes, okay? And the company that did this polling is Global Strategy Group, but they don't provide the raw data. They just give you the summary findings, which is basically a memo to interest, quote unquote, interested parties, just the people at the top. Um, this memo was released on March 15, 2021. Now, I was initially really excited. And I was like, oh, I want to see this because I figured, well, I want to look at it from, you know, use the data and look at it from my own point of view and see what it says. But understand this. When somebody else is paying for the, the, the polling survey, they want things to be skewed to help their point of view. Um, so it's by sometimes, you know, Findings can be somewhat biased, okay? Um, but within that, 
if the data is true, because in some cases they were showing that based on this, these findings that the, like, for example, the For the People Act is extremely popular. This is in bold. Um, they were saying that the voters across the board overwhelm, overwhelmingly support the bill. 83% support, 10% oppose. It has strong support across party lines as well, with 96% of Democrats, 74% of Republicans, and 73% of independents in favor of the For the People Act. This is where they get the, um, and I think I think this is, yeah, get dark get the dark money out of, uh, out of politics. Which that would I would like to see that one. That would be very interesting. But in any event, they make it so that they're talking specifically about West Virginia. But in reality, they're doing they're combining the survey based on all of those different states. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve states. All right. There's 12 states that they polled. All right. But you want to take the data from 12 states poll, which is a, I keep hearing the word conglomeration of the data of 12 different states. Okay, of the different states and apply it specifically to West Virginia. And I, I really have a problem with that. I would like to drill, personally, I would love to drill down into what West Virginia said so that when I say what I'm going to say, it makes more sense. Okay, now. Um, so that let's talk about Mr. Manchin. Mr. Manchin is from West Virginia. Mr. Manchin is a Democrat. Joe Manchin is a Democrat. All right. And he's in a conservative state. West Virginia is a conservative state. All right. Very conservative state. In fact, I believe I could be wrong about this. I think during the 2020 election, um, Trump took West Virginia. Over Biden, OK, by 40 some points. All right. So this I mean, this is how they are very, very um, Republican or conservative oriented. Now, that being the case, Mr. Manchin is Democrat. And I said that before, Manchin is a Democrat. Now, Mr. Manchin used to also be the governor of West Virginia. And is a very, very popular person in West Virginia. Now, Mr. Manchin's mode of politics or slant of politics. for Mr. Manchin is what he would call, let me see what he said. I think it's, uh, I wrote it down and of course now I've got to go find it. Ah, here it is. He describes himself as a moderate conservative, all right? Meaning that on some cases he will vote like his Democratic colleagues do, and in other cases he would vote like his Republican colleagues do, all right? So he comes somewhere, he's he's like a, I would, I'm, I'm reluctant to say he's a centrist, but he's like that, he's somewhere in the middle. 
Now, um, oh man, I gotta find out how many independent senators are there. Mm. I won't look this up. I'm looking up the real time. All right. Um, there are some that represent third parties, but let's see. I see one, two. Oh, yeah, Bernie Sanders, right? He's an independent. One, two. Oh, there's only two independents in the Senate right now who are independent senators in the Senate right now. So even though he's labeled a Democrat, he's not um, a radical progressive, you know, that when they come up with these things, they automatically vote for it. Because there's some really, really radical progressives in the Democratic Party right now, which they're asking for all kinds of stuff. That's just like, gosh, I'm not, I'm not even going to go down there. But anyway, it makes it, you know, going back to the, the guiding principles of, of how one votes in the Senate. Um, using that polling data, I would, you know, as, as a Senator Manchin, I would have a hard time selling that to my folks as well. And I, and I get it if I know that I'm in the midst of a bunch of conservative people, I'm a Democrat, and I position myself as a sort of a centrist, more moderate conservative. I'm not a heavy duty conservative, but I'm somewhere in the middle. I'm not too forward. I'm not too progressive either. I'm somewhere in the middle. The way things are set up right now and the way they have presented their argument, this is the Democrats when I say they, um, it's, understand, it's understandable why Mr. Manchin is positioning himself the way he is. He would love, I, I would imagine he would love to go further with that, but he doesn't have enough to sell it to his own people. And at the end of the day, that's really what he's focused on. Okay. And that's what I, if I were talking to him, I would tell him, look, listen to what your people are saying. That being the case, um, I, I kind of would be, um, kind of in a stalemate too. And I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say, oh, I want to do this because um, um, oh, I need bipartisanship, which is, you know, both sides voting on this. But unless Mr. Manchin has his own polling data that he can refer to, and maybe he does, um, I, I kind of would sit still on this too. No matter, even if there's a lot of people, and yes, the bills probably are very good, they're very nice, they do a lot of great, great things. But unless you have the supporting data where you can pick it apart and you can look at it and make a critical, um, a balanced critical analysis for yourself, which is what every American person, when they vote, is supposed to do. That's what voting is really about. It's about you not being um, pushed into a decision. But it is, it's about you taking the information, listening to it, and then taking some time out to figure out where your position is within the information. You know, um, does it, is it right for your part of the kingdom? And you can't allow yourself to be, lack of a better word, bullied into your own um, bullied into someone else's opinion for you because you have other people to answer to. That being the case, he's going to have to use his own guidance system, his own pulse of what's going on in his constituents, because he's at the end of the day, he's, he is, was sent 
to Washington to represent his people, not to represent the entire United States. I mean, yes, he does represent the entire United States, but it is his own people who send him back into the Senate every six years. And that's in 2024 when we elect a new president. All right. So, I mean, he doesn't have the um, nervousness as some people do who are being elected in 2022, which is also a very, very important election. Um, a lot of people are going to get sent home. A lot of people going to, a lot of new people going to be on the scene. But in any event, you have to make a conscious effort to think critically. Not because you're being bullied into a thought or idea, but you're being prompted into an idea based on, you know, your existence in the 3D world, but also a kingdom dweller. So you have dual citizenship. So you've got to do what's right for you on this earth but also do what's right for you in the kingdom. All right. So in Mr. Manton's case, he's going to have to pay a lot more attention to what his people are saying and not necessarily what everybody says his people are saying, which is that what's happening with that, <coughs> that survey memo. Sounds wonderful. Sounds great. But until you spend some time, wrestling with the information yourself and deciding where you want to come down on it, I wouldn't move on this either. I wouldn't move on it either because it's not telling you enough. And at the end of the day, you, again, he's going to have to, he's a Democrat <coughs> surrounded by a bunch of Republicans, not just in the Senate, but at home too. So he's got to make a right decision. And it is that, oh, you should make the right decision even if it means you get sent home forever. Look, ain't nobody trying to do that. Nobody, he's not trying to do that. You know, how you govern yourself and why you get sent up there is totally different than why somebody else does. And you cannot judge them as faulty because you don't recognize their view uh, as appropriate for you. All right. So you've got to, you've, you've got to be sober minded in this. And for myself, um, this is something um, I feel like with this particular podcast, this is something I would not have published myself if it wasn't for the fact that um, it involved another person, which is um, Senator Manchin, you know, um, as hard because when I look at it and let me, let me prep it. Let me stop that. Let me pull back. One, let me say this. I'm being called more and more to speak about politics and the economy. I will still talk about those things that are personal to um, the body of Christ crossing over into their promise, which is why I'm doing two podcasts a day versus the one. When this political thing passes, which I know it will, that I'll be able to do one again. But in the meantime, I'm doing two. All right. Um, because it, if you've listened to this podcast for any length of time, you've heard me on several occasions talk about things in our society, in our culture, things like that. So it's not uncommon for me to be pulled more into this than um, even I would like. Having said all that, this particular podcast is coming on not to persuade you to listen to my personal views about politics or economy, but it is me having to, one, come to terms with the fact that I'm being called more and more to speak about this stuff. And two, I'm speaking to a specific person. And three, you're basically like a voyeur listening in on my conversation with the most high God and myself dealing with Mr. Manchin's position on certain um, political issues or political concerns. 
other than that, I would not, I would have just left this in my, my prayer journal. It would have been something that would not have <clears throat> seen the light of day in terms of making a recording from it. But like I say, I'm being called more and more to deal with this. Further, it's just point four, if I was giving a number to it. Um, <clears throat> I, although I do watch a number of political shows, I still do my own research in terms of how I need to look at something. And I will take it through multiple passes uh, in prayer before I come to a conclusion. And that's my last, my uh, next and final point is continue to take these concerns through the matrix of prayer. Matrix being is a word. I know people talk about matrix and they talk about it in terms of, um, um, I'm going to give you the, the definition of matrix. I'm going to give you the biblical definition and the, um, definition of matrix and the world's definition of matrix. All right. In the Bible, Give me a second. I'm using my source is going to be um, Blue Letter Bible. All right. Blue Letter Bible. <coughs> and it's using, and it's a very great resource. I had a friend tell me about this. I just thought it was wonderful. When I saw it, I was just, oh my God. And I, I think she showed me this on my birthday. And I'm like, this really is a birthday gift, even though it's a, it's a website. I mean, it's just so helpful. You don't even need, um, you don't even need the, uh, your, all those books of your lexicons and your um, <clears throat> commentaries and cross references and things like that. So it's just, it's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Um, that's five, six, seven, four. Um, Wait, what did I do here? I don't know what I did. Let me go back. Matrix. All right. Dictionary. See, this is. <laughs> When I do stuff, I was like, you know, you would think I would just do this stuff before I get on the air, <laughs> but I don't. I just, um, I don't. So I'm looking for it because it's listed five times in the Bible and it's about. <sighs> So I think it's talking about the birth canal, like the womb of, especially in Exodus and Numbers, where it talks about uh, opening the womb in all flesh, or let's see. King James Dictionary. This is not what I'm looking for. I don't understand why I'm having such a hard time with this. Because any other time I would go straight to it and I'd be able to use the concordance, which is what I normally do. And for some reason I'm struggling. Oh boy. Hmm. Yeah, it's called the womb. I had to go somewhere else. I had to use a King James dictionary 
from um, av1611.com, <clears throat> meaning uh, uh, Latin from matrix from mother, matter, which is uh, the Latin for mother. It, it has several different um, definitions. One, the womb, the cavity in which the fetus of an animal is formed and nourished till its birth, a mold, the cavity in which anything is formed and which gives its shape as the matrix of a type, the place where anything is formed or produced as the matrix of metals gang. Um, in dyeing, the five simple colors, black, white, blue, red, yellow, of which all the rest are composed. So basically it's like a foundational thing. And it's the place where um, uh, things are birthed out. But in the meantime, while it, before it's birthed out, it's had time to grow and be nourished in a protected environment until it can safely be delivered into another external environment. Now, I use this particular term when I talk about prayer. Because a lot of times when it's in pr when you're in prayer, it's like you are birthing something out. And <clears throat> while it's in your, um, the womb of your mind, which I, you know, oh my gosh, now I understand that. Um, while it's in the womb of your mind or the womb of your soul, it's being developed until you can it's safely large enough and healthy enough to exist in another dimension okay and that's what you need to do with your your idea about voting about how you're going to live your life on this earth realm because what you see isn't necessarily what you get you have to go by what the kingdom tells you about your external environment versus what the environment, the external environment is telling you about the external environment, right? So um, I, in a lot of ways, I'm going to do the summary now. And when I first, when I do these particular podcasts, um, as when I do them, when I am in prayer and I write them out as a prayer in my journal, a lot of times before I go into, allow it to go through a matrix of prayer, I think I know what the answer is, but I don't necessarily have the mind. It's the mind of Laverne versus the mind of God. And what I'm seeking is the mind of God. I don't, the mind of Laverne will send me down a dirty ditch. Okay. It will send me into some, some place that I don't want to go. Whereas the mind of God will always lead me to a safe resolution, a safe and optimum and positive resolution. I may not often like the answer initially, but I know it's good for me and not just good to me. You follow me? All right. Now, in this situation with uh, Joe Manchin, um, don't be particularly hard on him. You know, everybody's putting their mouth on him. And it's not necessarily a good thing because you don't know what he's having to deal with. If you've walked in his shoes, you walk in a person's shoes for at least a mile, you know what they're about. And in his particular situation, um, you know, I, it's silly to ask for, I want bipartisanship. I want bipartisanship. Um, the problem isn't with Joe Manchin. It really isn't with Joe Manchin. The problem, whew, wow, wow, do I need to? I, I was trying to avoid not doing this. The problem really is that we have one party right now. Only one party is showing up for work every day during these sessions. <clears throat> Okay, only one party is showing up for work during these congressional sessions. <sighs> and that's the Democrats. They're prepared to debate, um, you know, negotiate.
and reconciliate. But what's happening is, and we see it, but nobody wants to really talk about it and nobody wants to pray about it, is that the Republicans, see, I, I was a Republican. I was a Republican. I thought I, I would have, when I was a Republican, I wouldn't dream of voting for Clinton. And I didn't, I, let's not take that back. I did not vote for Bill Clinton because I was that staunch of a Republican, all right? Um, when the Republicans were good, they were very good, all right? When they were good, they were very, I mean, this is the, we're talking about the era of the Jack Kemp's and the Bob Dole's and the um, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, not uh, W, the little one, but his daddy, Papa Bush, all right? When those guys were on the scene, that's when the Republican Party was at its finest. And it really, really, really represented something. I can't always say that about Ronald Reagan because Ronald Reagan had a very, he didn't necessarily have a seducing spirit, but he did have this way of um, <clears throat> positioning himself so that people were afraid to oppose him. It's kind of like Donald Trump, but without the obvious um, pushiness. Ronald Reagan hid his pushiness, but he was pushy, all right? Or he had other people do the pushy, pushiness. But um, like I said, I was never a real fan of Ronald Reagan, but I was a massive, 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 massive fan of George Herbert Walker Bush, the late Herb George Herbert Walker Bush. And I, I, the only thing, I'm just so disappointed that I never got to meet him. I always wanted to meet him because he was the reason why I became um, a Republican for a season. I was like for an, a nanosecond, I was a Republican. Um, and the reason why I say that is he, his, his level of politics was such that it's not showy. Um, uh, it's not showy but a lot gets done behind the scenes and you just show up and you just realize, you just look and go, wow, that situation got taken care of and there was no bloodshed. I mean, perfect example was the dissolution of the Soviet Union. If you, and that being the case, you have to um, weigh things based on your own analysis of stuff and, and it cannot be um simple these are very very perilous times and because your finances um your family other concerns are can are on this 3d realm you have to take it into a process of prayer connected to the agenda of the kingdom so it's not just oh how how does this best suit me on the earth or how does this best suit me in the kingdom it's about bringing all of that in all of that of, about your life into this place of prayer like an ark like if the world was to end today on the outside of you could you still make it on the inside could you be in this kind of cocooning situation where um, you had the wisdom of God moving you through some of the most disastrous of situations? Now, I'm just presenting you with a hypothetical. I'm not saying this is prophetically happening or will happen, but I'm just saying that is the level of faith that we're talking about, is that when you're in the kingdom, you should be able to be sustained without any distress about what will happen to you, but you've done the internal work of inquiring of the Lord um, and bringing every concern about your well-being and passing it through the matrix of prayer. It's just like how the priest, the high priest would do with the umen. I'm not saying this right, the umen and the thumen, where there was a 12 stones on the chest and then there was the um, there was a, a two stones in the ephod 
that uh, were a light stone and a dark stone that would give you a yes or a no. Well, that's the same thing with our prayer life. It has to be, everything has to be brought through and all your concerns have to be brought through a level of prayer, a dimension of prayer, so that you know precisely what is the will of God for your life. Even if it's on a political stage, even if it's on uh, related to the economy, everything. Because like I said before, what you see is not necessarily what you get. And, and, and it's funny because the Christians get so put out when they like, oh, there's so much deception going. Of course there's deception. Not everybody's saved. Not everybody is saved. So why are you stressed out when you see so much sin? And that's why there's so much sin is because sinners are practicing sin. That's why we call them sinners. Okay. Now I've danced around this entire podcast and I've just gone off on a tangent in a lot of ways, but the, 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 the takeaway from this is everything is brought through prayer. Okay. And that's really my final point. But um, when it comes to this, this corporate promise that I'm going to pray or say, over this situation. I, I don't want you to, um, if you are a person who was, who are, who is of the uh, liberal persuasion or the progressive persuasion of the democratic party, or you, you see things in a, a with a, a liberal or progressive bias. I don't want you beating up on Senator Manchin because he's being, um, what would appear to be stubborn. What he's praying for is for his Republican colleagues to come back to their senses is what he's praying for. And even had I not brought this into prayer, I would not have been able to see that because on the, in the face of it and how the news presents things, how the news presents things, you would think that it is Senator Manchin's fault. And that's not what the problem is. The problem is that conservatives in this country have lost their compass on how to discern things. And Senator Manchin is waiting for them to gain that insight again. That's really what he's waiting for. Because it's like these guys were my road dogs. And when you have somebody, so they're like, they're like, what's the kid, what the kids say, the ride or die. Uh, I want you to bear in mind that there is, um, when you have a person who's your ride or die kind of person, that's what the kids say, ride or die. Meaning that it's kind of like that old thing with Thelma and Louise when they were going over that cliff and, and they would rather die together or ride together. You ride together when things are going good and you die together when things go bad. And I think in some ways, Senator Manchin is in that position of ride or die with his conservative colleagues. Um, it, it's very unsafe for him, perhaps, but, and frustrating for people watching. However, um, the pressure is, should be placed, again, should be placed on Senator Manchin, should be placed on his Republican colleagues, which re really, 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 really need a lot of prayer right now. Because they're having to deal, hoo, 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 hoo with a situation where there's a lot of seducing spirits around them. And if you've ever dealt with narcissists or seducing spirits, they are a, a particularly vicious, a particularly vicious nature and a very long memory in terms of, of, uh, of, um, of uh, how to um, posture yourself, okay? So uh, let's just go through this. I is an old side guy speaking and this is related to um, Senator Manchin. Um, and this is also to me. 
So it is, I will help you to assist Senator Manchin's insight into how his vote might be guided. I will help you to encourage him to keep a closer watch on the pulse of his own constituents in the season. I will help you to deal with accepting that you're being called more and more to speak out on politics and the economy. I will help you to avoid being unduly influenced by political news shows, but by my spirit. I will help you to continue to take these concerns through the matrix of prayer. I've spoken it and it shall surely come to pass. And again, um, I'm being called to do two of these shows instead of one. So we'll see how that goes. This is going to be very interesting. And that's all I have for you today. I'm your host, Coach Laverne. That's Laverne without the E on the end for action taken. And if you didn't know, this podcast can also be viewed on YouTube in its entirety. So if you've watched it on YouTube, don't forget to like, subscribe, and select the bell notification for when new Action Taken podcasts drop. Our next broadcast is June 11th. Have a wonderful and prosperous day. And see you soon.